The Making of My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy is brought to you by Skillshare. The first 500 people to sign up will receive two months for free at the link in the description. The MTV Video Music Awards took place on Sunday night, September 13th, live from New York City's Radio City Music Hall. Awards were won by Taylor Swift for female video. As per every MTV event, there was a little controversy. Yo, Taylor, I, I'm really happy for you. I'm gonna let you finish. But Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. One of the best videos of all time. The young lady seems like a perfectly nice person. She's getting her award. What's he doing Why would up he there? Do that? He's a jackass. Kanye West tour has been canceled, but so were you a fan before? Yeah, <laughs> it's Kanye West. It was just, it was rude, period. And I like to be able to apologize to her in person. Let me ask something. I was fortunate enough to meet your mom and talk with your mom a number of years ago. What do you think she would have said about this? Um. Obviously, you know, I, I deal with hurt. So many, you know, celebrities, they never take the time off. And I, I've never taken the time off to really, you know, I just music after music and tour after tour and tour. And I, I'm just ashamed that my hurt calls, you know, someone else's hurt. My, but I need to, after this, take some time off and just analyze how I'm going to, you know, make it through the, the rest of this life, how I'm going to improve. You know, I, I, I want to I wanna live this thing as hard. At this time, Kanye seemed to have truly done himself in. Many would blame the outburst on the bottle of Hennessy that swung around in one hand while he escorted Amber Rose down the red carpet in the other. But it was something deeper, and Kanye would acknowledge that he was in an overworked state, with the tragic passing of his mother weighing heavy on him. Whatever combination of emotions led to that moment, the media was there to back West into a corner, ready to publish every tabloid headline they could milk out of him. A grandiose tour with Lady Gaga was set to begin, but both artists mutually agreed to cancel the tour in the wake of the overwhelming public scrutiny. The only thing that could put a bandage on the situation was time. During this time, Most Def told Kanye that he needed to leave the country. He needed to go into self-exile, to regroup, far away from the paparazzi and the critics. Most is always, he came to my house after the uh, MTV Awards. He said, look, man, you gotta get out of the country, man. This is just too much. I like literally left America. I stopped doing music altogether. I just took some time. I went to Japan just so I can get away from paparazzi altogether. And then in November, I moved to Rome and just like lived there. When in Rome, he interned at Fendi as he was getting serious about his fashion endeavors. He also made sure to soak in the art, music, and culture of these places. There was inspiration at every corner. Yet, Kanye claimed that he was done with music. He found fashion far more interesting. He enjoyed finding other mediums to work in. Still, Kanye couldn't help but think of music. As he spoke to Noah Callahan Bever of Complex, he explained that he was conceptualizing music that would have melodies like those in 808s and Heartbreak, mixed with the raw drums of Mob Deep. And then when I came back to the States, uh, I moved to Hawaii and lived there. Wow. Lived there for like six months and just worked on music again. I didn't know that part. On the island of Oahu, Kanye was brewing a new storm. This time, though, if he was going to make music, he would be facing higher stakes than ever. He would need to redeem himself in the eyes of the public. The outcast needed to prove his place in music. Good music would be his resurrection. He needed to remind the world that, love him or hate him, he's great at what he does. But he couldn't do this alone. He needed a team, and it was quite a team, with a roster full of all-stars. He flew them all out to the island to help create what Kanye set out to be his magnum opus. Despite the leisurely beauty of Hawaii, Kanye's camp was hard at work all day and night. Kanye booked Oahu's AVEX Studios for 24 hours a day, indefinitely. At the time, fans were expecting Kanye's album to be titled Good Ass Job. As the album became darker, more progressive, and more complex, it became deserving of a more expressive title. Kanye announced the title My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy on Twitter. The title was both lengthy and extremely blunt. I got to watch Kanye make some of the last records. Dark <laughs> Twisted Fantasy record. Yeah, the Twisted Fantasy record, yeah. man. And, you know, he lived it. 
Yeah. He was living it. I was just impressed. Like, first of all, everybody in the studio had suits on. Everybody. You're kidding me. I'm serious. Yo, I thought he had like flown in a bunch of guys from like Europe or something, but like all the all the engineers and everybody was in like black suits and white white shirts and black tie. Like he he set up a mood. Right. Yeah. That when you walked in there, you felt this mood. Woke up with him and you know, I spent like two weeks out in Hawaii while he was working on this album. And looking at his regimen, I'm gonna tell you something this young man does, y'all. They get up every morning and eat breakfast together, his whole crew. And they talk about yesterday and the next day and the day of and the present. They plan on over breakfast. They sit there and they talk about what they're gonna do, what they did, and how to make the, the music better. Then they go exercise together. Go to the YMCA, they play basketball, lift weights, focus, get the energy out, get the chi up. And then they hit the studio around four o'clock. First he, well, first he'll do some charity work, fight all these kids and do some charity shit. So therefore he's doing a good deed of the day as well. Good karma. And then he goes to the studio and he stays there from four. And when I was there, we left at four. So 12 hours of in the studio work. Then go to bed, get up, and do it again the next day. And during the process of all that, the, sp- the stylist comes in with pictures. The publicist comes in with publicity. You know what I mean? At the time, he had his, his girlfriend to come in with the little lovey dove. And the, the way everything happened, though, was like focus energy, yo. I never seen that from a rapper before. I come from Wu Tang Clan. You know, y'all know us. We five of us, five of us show for the concert. Other three late. Some ain't doing it, some is sleeping, you know what I mean? And it's it's not only his talent that took him to the top, I gotta say, it's his focus, y'all. I started the album really January 1st, I got focused and was down in Hawaii just grinding every day. The song like Power took 5,000 hours, like literally 5,000 man hours to do this one record. And it's, that's the amount of time I was put into every song. Five thousand man hours to make the song. Like, and you can you can hear it. So so much work rewriting, rethinking about. Every line, I just needed time alone with my own thoughts. Got treasures in my mind, but couldn't open up my own vault. My childlike creativity, purity, and honesty is honestly being crowded by these grown thoughts. Reality is catching up with me, taking my inner child. I'm fighting for custody with this responsibility that they entrusted me. As I look down at my diamond encrusted teeth, thinking no one man should have all this power. But what I'm the the subjects of the battle of creativity and I feel like I'm a crusader of opening people's minds. You know, everyone says how great art comes from pain, but I think my greatest art comes from excitement and joy. It's a completely different, a uh, completely different perspective about being extremely excited about something that is only cool to me. Did you hear the beginning of Dark Fantasy? Just the layers of those vocals crashed up against RZA and that's using us the history of everything we have. You know, uh, Chris Martin will talk to me about the drums, the black drums and stuff, the 808s and like how rock wouldn't have that. And for us to juxtapose and crash the, the guitar sounds uh, with synthesizer sounds, with auto-tune, with strings, with cellos, with classic Broadway melodies. With we get much if I was a little kid, I would make a song called Toast for the Douchebags. That would be what I would sing in gym or something against like 808 drums and then hard like Wu-Tang sounds above it with amazing raps and then with poetry and everything. And that's, and that's what this art form, these are like paintings, especially for this album. Kid Cudi was an integral part of the studio sessions. Often secluding himself in the studio to hash out ideas alone He would then present Kanye with some of the most infectious hooks and bridges to truly make the album shimmer. To bring these two things together, to not be limited by the art form of rap, but to have rap bring it to another level. So you notice there's times where I completely 
Is it rap or is it poetry? Is it spoken word? Is it, is, is it a speech? For this album, Kanye wanted to focus much more on his rapping skills and spent more time writing than he had before. Prior to Dark Fantasy, most of his lyrics were come up with in the booth as opposed to being written first. Penitentiary chances, the devil dances, and eventually answers. To the call of autumn, all them falling, for the love of balling, get caught with 30 rocks, the cop look like Alec Baldwin. In order to make the rapping even stronger on the album, Kanye had to tag team with heavy hitters. One of those hitters was Pusha T. He definitely, he definitely makes sure that, um, that I've been heard. Honestly, mm -hmm. and, and that I've been out there, and I mean, we just work, man. We work, and this guy's a workaholic. Mm -hmm. Like he was like, "Hey, this is my album. I like how you rap. You can write to anything on this album." Man, I've always been a fan of the the Clips albums. They made multiple hip hop classics. In, in my world, every time that they would drop some, that's all we would listen to over and over and over. It's just like, just we we would just vibe and just really became cool like on tour like on the graduation tour and just every interview that he would do anybody ever like would just attack me He'd just be like are you are, are you serious are you kidding like so he showed like a lot of just stand up uh principles i used to be in the studio with him and record playing like five six years ago and i would just be hearing this and i'd be like man this man is amazing right here he, he need, need people need to really understand the the sincerity of his lyrics. The kilos came, we gave you Bobby Brown job. Pusha T was not used to rewriting verses. He is a wordsmith who is surgical with his lyrics. But when it came to his verse on Runaway, Kanye wanted Pusha to dig deep, to be even more of a douchebag, he said. He wanted the verse to sound like the worst person talking down to his woman. Pusha would later say that he was going through the ending of a real relationship. He felt he didn't have the emotion in him but he ended up writing a scathing verse about a cold-blooded man in love with himself and his wealth. I, I did it, all right, all right, I admit it. No. Features from Jay-Z, Rick Ross, and Psy High the Prince naturally delivered quality bars, and a surprise appearance from Raekwon gave the album more grit. The samples used weren't the same uplifting soul sounds from his first three albums. And I don't know if anybody's heard this song, you can look it up online, Mama's Boy. With Ye, and we try things like we do so many different versions of things. He did another version with Soldier Boy, like too. He did so many versions, but I wanted you guys to hear one of the things that I did for here. for that album. This is. Voices of our parents, bad choices, the aftermath of the forces. I never liked you niggas. Who knew one day I'd be just like you niggas? Uh, 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 all right, you niggas. Uh, 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 all right, you niggas. With Kanye West and working with those types of guys, I was yeah. curious as far as when you get that much creative juice mm -hmm. in the same room, I mean, how, what's the process you guys go through with, with kind of creating a track? Well, we got to get through the explosiveness part first. I mean, that, that means... You know, it's just like a big bomb about to, ex a yeah, musical yeah. bomb about to explode in the room. Uh -huh. But then we just kind of map out the ideas. You know what I'm saying? What are we doing? What are we going to do? Once, I, you know, I get to playing beats and then the ideas start flowing and I wait for somebody to say that one. Add a little sugar. <laughs> After 808s and Heartbreak, audiences realize the unpredictable nature of Kanye's style. The sample used for one of the standout tracks, So Appalled, is uniquely dark and atmospheric for a hip-hop song. So I get to go all the way to the studio, it's Rick Ross in there, Amber Rose, yay. And I walk in and he was just rapping all my raps. So he's rapping, he's like, yo, I think you're super dope, woo -woo, I gotta go. But I got this song that I want to know if you can help me with a hook on it. And I'm like, what's the name of it? And it was So Appalled. I'm so appalled, spawning ball. So I wrote a hook for it and um, I put it on there and that's how he asked me to do. I'm just little me and the engineer. I'm like, yo, can you put me at the end of the beat? Cause the beat was like eight minutes long. I was like, put me at the end. I just want to write a verse. Cause I don't have nothing to do. So I just wrote a verse, wrapped it and told him to put it at the end of the song. I was at the power video shoot and he was just like, yo, I, I let Jay-Z and them hit a record. 
I didn't press stop on the uh, <laughs> on the record, and your verse just came in. Huh. I am so outrageous. outrageous. I want my pride on my sleeve like a and Beyonce said, "Whoever that is, you need to sign him." God had an iPod, I be on this playlist. So that that was when I was signed with Kanye West at the Power video shoot. You know, all those folks got on after my verse. So Jay heard my verse as well. It was like, I like this song. That was my dream. How should I begin this? I'm just so offended. How am I even mentioned? So positive. It's like that sometimes. It's better than everything. Tony doing time for what he did to not screw up. And yo, champagne wishes and dirty white bitch. You know this shit is. So much music was being made during the team sessions that Kanye decided to be charitable. He announced a series of releases called Good Fridays. Kanye gave his fans 14 free songs. But I don't know why. Four of them ended up on the album. They were dressed up better once they were on the finished product, with the greatest addition being a rousing verse from Rick Ross at the end of the track, Devil in a New Dress. Getting Tupac money twice over, still a real nigga red cool. Sometimes we go on Good Fridays and just joke around and put out, you know, what we're feeling off the cuss. Technology is the reason why we do Good Fridays. You couldn't have done that in the back in the days when they had, you know, 24 track reels and it took so long. Like, literally, I'm programming Good Fridays things over the phone and saying, put this chorus here and checking it on emails. Hey, everybody, it's been nice tonight. I've been waiting for my whole life. Who would have known what it was like? Running from the splashing light. And because of that, you all get more product, better, high-quality product. But from those Good Friday sessions, a monster emerged. Really, I was in uh, Hawaii in the studio with Kanye, and um, I walked. He, he wanted to play something for me, and um, I walked in the studio. He cut the beat on. Start spitting his raps just before he even laid the verse. Everybody know I'm a motherfucking monster. Nicki Minaj actually, actually in the studio. Um, she's writing her verse. Um, so I just laid back, and what I actually did was really just me being in the room. I knew the structure of the song, but I just did an intro for it. You know, fat motherfucker, and I look who's in trouble as you run through the jungle. So you hear his rumbles. I wanted to do some different intro shit, like, you know, like if this was the Thriller album. Because as I'm sitting in the room, I'm thinking to myself, this what must have working on the chronic must have felt like. Kanye, Justin Vernon of Bon Iver. Jay-Z and Rick Ross created a song that would go down in hip-hop history. Despite their contribution, no one shined better than up-and-coming rapper Nicki Minaj. That was the day I, I, I uh, Nicki Minaj earned my respect as a lyricist. Before that, before that day, she was a, a great entertainer. But for me, with my own two eyes, to get in the studio and see her write her verse, that when I heard and watched her lay it, I knew that was going to be one of the greatest verses of this year, as well as Kanye, he, he said it right then. That song, and that was a moment in time. I've never seen anything like that happen. Yeah. I definitely, I remember Kanye called me and he said, I know, I know this is good. I know niggas is going to say this is the best verse of my album. I'm taking a chance by putting this shit on here, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he took other takes and put them together in one take. Pink wig, thick ass, give them whiplash. Because I did not want all those grunting sounds. These niggas that one track minded. He was like, nah, I like that. That's dope. I was like, no, no. She on a guy at her pocket and chase. It just should be a, just a couple, you know, just a couple. Now look at what you just saw. This is what you live for. And he was so like obsessed with that little dumb monster voice. He wanted it to be in the whole thing. <laughs> I'm a motherfucking monster. The song was so good that Kanye pulled it from being a free song in order to use it as an official single for the album. And everything I'm trying to bring a piece of my, my childhood out in every piece of music that I put out. The multi-instrumental talents of Mike Dean were utilized, with his production and engineering being pushed even more to the forefront than ever before. Ever since Dark Fantasy, Mike Dean's signature touch has been augmented on every Kanye collaboration. In terms of, of the different things that you do, what, what part of the process 
do you feel most comfortable with that you just enjoy? I mean, you've made mixing part of the production. You've made mastering part of the production. You don't yeah. think of them as separate process, but what exactly. part do you enjoy the most, the creating the music part? Yeah, probably playing guitar solos. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Like, how do you review songs where Rick Ross comes in six minutes after a guitar solo? It, I mean, I'm offering so much more. Like, the songs are seven, eight minutes long. Like, how do, how do you even send this in for reviews? Why, do, why would people even, like, play themselves to even review it? You haven't even heard that before. Yeah. And now we'll go to the radio. Now that it's wrong, motherfucker. Now play this. Play this five-minute song that completely f***s up your programming. Like, play this. You know, that's, you know, that's in lineage of... It's, it's, it's the best respect that we can pay to like great artists that have inspired us so much is to never, f***ing, never sell out. All of the Lights would show the peak of Kanye's collaborative and curation-based production. Production of All the Lights! It's, it's a, it, You gotta come out of DJ. Shakers, trumpets, saxophone, vocals, alto, soprano, antenna. Elton John, Alicia Keys, Rihanna, Trey, all of them on there. Turn up the lights in your baby. He ain't asked them to sing their own verse or their own part. He asked them, could you sing a melody for a background? Like, they singing, we are the world. You know how they, everybody sing, we are the world. Yeah, got them in there. All of the lights. Alicia Keys in there, pregnant. I'm like, this is the... This is history. I mean, hell, is she just idolized all the Swiss beats. He, you know, Swiss beats, he's super doozy. He cut it, bounce, boom, like all of the lights. The song's interlude is performed by Elton John as his piano skills add a classical nature. The subject of love and loss permeated the album. The songs Blame Game and Lost in the World, respectively, show the end of one love and the beginning of another. Let's play the play. While no names are spoken, it is clear that Blame Game is a song lamenting the end of Kanye's relationship with Amber Rose that year. On the bathroom wall it wrote, I'd rather argue with you than to be with someone else. The somber piano keys interpolated from Aphex Twin's Avril 14th gave the song a tearful aesthetic. The tragic outro of the track is performed by comedian Chris Rock. I, I stopped in there a few nights, yeah. and we, we did the blame game. We blame did the game. blame game. Baby, you done took this shit to the another mother level. Although it's genuinely funny, Chris Rock goes on a monologue from the perspective of a man sleeping with Kanye's girlfriend. Just as Kanye says his lover forgot to hang up her phone, their conversation begins to play in the background. I heard the whole thing. Lost in the World, on the other hand, is a song about the beginning of love. Having sampled Woods by Bon Iver, Kanye had recruited Justin Vernon to help him complete the track. This had spawned a successful collaborative relationship that has grown past the making of this album. He's so open in the studio, he's so willing to, he's very encouraging. And, uh, and he really like tries to get the best out of people. And uh, I learned a lot from him and uh, watching him work and watching him not ever give up and making sure that, that, that every idea was the best idea. The lyrics to Kanye's verse are actually the words from a love letter that he wrote for Kim Kardashian. You're my devil, you're my angel, you're my heaven, you're my... I was working on Dark Fantasy. I remember I was trying to explain to a girl that I love so much um, how much I loved him. And I, uh, I didn't have any words to this record, but we loved it, we loved the beat. Actually, in an email, in an email, I wrote this to her, I said, you're my heaven, you're my heaven, you're my freedom, you're my jail. It was like, she brought this poetry out of me that ended up becoming what the lyrics were. And then eventually she ended up becoming my wife and she's here tonight. Lost in the world and down for the night, Kanye was ready to experience all of what life and new love had to offer. Down for the night. Any great album needs a great album cover. But what happens when you can't settle for just one? 
Kanye met with contemporary American artist George Kondo to conceptualize the official album artwork. The artist ended up with five covers. The main cover was a cartoonish image of a man seemingly meant to be Kanye and an armless phoenix with a human body. It wasn't long before the image was banned from retail. The fact people ask me about that cover with the phoenix, I'm like, if I was five years old and somebody had that drawing, I would be jealous of it. Like, man, how'd you come up with that? The girl with no arms, with the, with the wings. Like, man, that's awesome. Look at those colors. The cartoon is a very uh, bizarre weapon against um, the sort of intellectual concept of what our uh, supposedly high art culture is all about. For example, when I did the Kanye West album cover of The Dark Twisted Fantasy, I used a sort of a cartoon language in this painting of, of this interracial couple. That idea of an interracial couple on the cover of an album was something that had never been done. You either see one or the other, but you never see that. And to use a sort of childlike way of expressing that blew so many fuses that they really had to ban it. They couldn't put it out because it was too close to a language that kids were familiar with, but the subject was too politically charged for children to say understand. And then it also infuriates the older generation to see, like, suppose they subjectify the idea of their child making something like that, not something they could show in school to their teacher. And so the, the cartoon is a strange weapon in that sense. We just pixelated the cover. You know, it was disappointing for me because it's funny, it's like I was um, uh, chilling with my ex-fiance like about three months ago because we were still very good friends. And she just, she was just like, yo, you, you're very 70s right now. Just your whole vibe, but just when the artistry was on that level, like some Pink Floyd and people like Ohio players are putting out covers, or even just like getting suited up. Music videos are par for the course in nearly every major album release, and Kanye was trying to see just how much more innovative his videos could be. When it came to the music video for Power, which would be the first video from West for the album, Kanye approached the concept of a moving painting. She saw the Power piece was uh, basically like a trailer or a moving poster or a moving portrait. I'm bored with the usual way that videos are. It just makes you want to look at a video one time, but to create something that people you know, get something new every time they watch it. Because there's people who say, yo, I didn't like it the first time I saw it, but by the sixth time I understood it. The fact that you had to look at it six times is everything. That yeah. I always, you know, feel like songs deserve visuals that might not have the budget for you like, to really do it. And, <laughs> and Having been inspired by a visual art piece known as Civilization by Marco Brambilla, Kanye knew a collaboration was necessary. Kanye was a big fan of the civilization. He contacted my gallery and asked if he could commission a video work for me. And that led to the current piece uh, for Power. Uh, this is a highly constructed, uh, highly manned, somewhat religious tableau that communicates uh, the end of an empire. Filmmaking was a medium that Kanye was deeply interested in. Having several music video directing credits under his belt, he looked towards a larger project. Inspired by the works of Fellini, Stanley Kubrick, Michael Jackson, and Prince, Kanye directed a short film titled Runaway, after the song of the same name. The art direction was done by artist Vanessa Beecroft, screenwriting was handled by Hype Williams, and cinematography was done by Kyle Kim. I was mostly inspired by colors, like the palettes, the color, it's like technicolor all through it, and just the emotion that I wanted to put in, and, and the, the main meaning of the film is just express yourself and don't let people tell you how to think or how to be. To see the final product is like, it really, literally, the first time I saw it brought tears to my eyes because I've never seen myself like that before. So vulnerable and committed to something. So I'm excited. I think anyone that's willing to put not only themselves out there, but their ideas in such a profound way, I think it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. Videos for All of the Lights, Lost in the World, and Monster were created as well with the latter only being premiered on West's website due to the explicit content that was labeled as overly violent and misogynistic by critics. Jesus died for our sins. Michael died for the sins of our media. Jesus had the Bible. Uh, he had Wikipedia. You know, I'm the... gone. I nigga dead. Just fighting, I feel like fighting that battle that Mike had. When Kanye went on his official press run, half of it was an apology tour. 
The other half was setting the record straight. We were alluding to when you walked onto the VMAs and grabbed the mic from Taylor Swift, and, yeah. and some people said this wasn't a guy expressing his musical preference. Yeah. What I was expressing was my frustration from years and years of seeing, you know, Yo, how am I supposed to talk if you're going to run this thing in the middle while I'm talking? I'm hearing it while I'm trying to talk. Okay, can you take the sound out of the uh, overheads, please? With Taylor, with this 12-year-old, 18-year-old girl, uh, <laughs> me um, cutting her off, it showed like a lack of compassion with everything she went to to deserve this one moment that just shouldn't, that shouldn't even be categorized with the greatest living artist that we have to date to even be put in the same category. You know, it's just... It's just, it's just disrespect was retarded. Uh, well, what's funny is I have to just defend Kanye for a real quick sec because I really, I really like him and uh, he's been so good to me. You know, he came out to see our show in London and he, he's, he, he reminds me of a guy I grew up with. You know, the thing that nobody talks about when the, that whole debacle went down is that he was right. <laughs> but, you know, he wasn't. He, <laughs> the Beyonce video was the best video of the decade. You know, what's so arrogant about that moment? If anything, it's selfless. If anything, I'm walking around now with half an arm trying to sell albums and having it go on and walk in rooms and be afraid of like my food getting spat in and people. I ain't lost all total respect for you. Oh, it's the best video of the decade the most influential, most memorable. You can't tell me anything that we remember more in the past 10 years. So the audacity of it losing anything, anything, it should be like Lauryn Hill when she won all those Grammys, you just couldn't lose. Guarantee if it was the other way around and Taylor Swift was 15, 12, 15 years into the game and on her 40th video or 50th video and she made the video of her career, do you think she would have lost to a brand new artist? Hell no. Kanye's song Runaway, which he had named his film after, would be premiered at the 2010 VMA Awards. Kanye was nervous to return to the stage, and audiences were anticipating new antics. But there were no antics this time, just art. He was not guaranteed to gain their love, but he was determined to earn their respect. But it, it's fun. It's entertainment. Uh -huh. Whatever happened? Whatever happened to the real, the stars? The rock stars. Whatever happened to the Muhammad Ali's? Like. When you define rock star, you think of somebody that's rebellious somebody that leads their own path. So to me, that's what makes him a rock star because he's a leader, he's a trendsetter. It's like a life is in color uh -huh. and I plan to be bright red. I want you to see me. Uh, I'm disrespecting the amount of blessings that God has given me to not scream it out loud. My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy was released to widespread acclaim. Audiences and critics alike were impressed with the project's depth and polish. I feel so fearless, like, to do an album, right, after the year that I had, and all, after all the, your career is over, and die, nigga, die, and you'll never make music again, and to come back and do 100,000 the first day digital alone, to be slated to do 600,000 in the first week. And I, I don't talk about the numbers, but what that number says is that People want me to keep making music and for me to not give up. Dark Twisted Fantasy is so the good. The best record ever. You think it's what? number one? I think it's better than what, Thriller album? and Purple Rain. This it's the best album of the Jeez. last 50 it's years. Nice Everyone's it on it. it. It's got something for everybody, man. It's like an old time, it's like one of those old time records. It's like one of those Quincy Jones records that got a little something for everybody, man. Dark Fantasy, the first song is f it just insanity that yeah. the start of the f 
The fact that the album starts with Nikki just talking. We'll gather around, children. It's separate lesson. Like, it's <laughs> it, top to bottom, that album, you can make a case. It's right there. 600,000 coming off being the most hated person this time last year. It shows you. It shows you what they, where they try to villainize, the way they try to do that. If you say anything, then you lose everything. If you say anything, then you lose everything. If you're a real artist, have no fear. Say what the f you want, do what you want, make what you want. Baby, I got a plan. Run away fast as you can. So, with that, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for watching. If you're like me or you're a fan of my channel, then more than likely you enjoy learning about how music is made, especially on a technical level. And that is how I found Skillshare to be so useful. Their premium membership gives you unlimited, high-quality classes from experts working in their fields. So you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work that you love. If you're into music production and mixing like I am, then you'll love Young Guru's class on mixing and mastering. Young Guru is a Grammy-nominated engineer most known for his work with Jay-Z. His courses have a ton of gems for anyone who loves music. Or if you want to learn how to make videos like me, there are classes on video editing and motion graphics from beginner to advanced levels. Skillshare is also more affordable than most learning platforms out there. An annual subscription with Skillshare is less than $10 a month. The first 500 people to sign up using the link in the description will receive a two-month free trial to Skillshare. It's a great deal that will give you plenty of time to learn and discover new passions.